So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, this is now the interactive discussion component of the day, where we have the special honor to have His Excellency, Ambassador Makase Nifisi, uh, Ambassador of Lesotho. Uh, we just heard an excellent lecture from the Ambassador on the topic, the Sadak Regional Integration and Development, the challenges facing Lesotho. So what we'd like to do with this discussion is first of all, give you a chance to ask him specific questions uh, about Lesotho and about the presentation you just heard. The second thing we'd like to do is to really benefit from the expertise of the Ambassador, which goes much beyond also Lesotho and have an interactive discussion uh, on the topic that we've been dealing with throughout most of the day, uh, meaning bridging economic, uh, building economic bridges, integrating cultural diplomacy into nation branding, corporate social responsibility, and global governance. So we have a rare opportunity here where there's really an expert, in my opinion, on all of those topics, uh, someone who at least has had direct experience with it. Uh, we're also joined by some colleagues from the Embassy of Sierra Leone who will be presenting later this evening as well. So I'm looking forward to he hearing maybe some of your perspectives from Sierra Leone. Uh, and as you all know, we have a special chance uh, later tonight uh, to have a presentation from Sierra Leone as well as a wonderful dance performance. Uh, so we'll finally have some culture. Uh, cultural components of the day uh, in terms of actually visual arts. So we're looking forward to that as well. But beforehand, let's, let's begin with the discussion. And if I may, maybe Your Excellency, I'll just pose an initial question just to get the ball rolling. And then I very much hope that we can turn the microphone over immediately to all of you. Uh, so this is, uh, can be more interactive. We tried this earlier today with uh, Dr. Sapachi, uh, although his answers were so detailed, it didn't allow for as much back and forth as I would like. Uh, so that's really where I think tonight uh, we should have a special opportunity. So Your Excellency, as you look at this topic, uh, building economic bridges, integrating cultural diplomacy into nation branding, what are, what are your own perspectives? I mean, you touched on this a little bit in your lecture. I mean, a small country like Lesotho, uh, some would argue, has to punch a little bit above its weight uh, in the case of really as a small country, really to make sure the voice gets heard. Uh, you know, whether we want to call soft power, cultural diplomacy, nation branding. I wonder if you could, to get the discussion going, comment a little bit. Uh, what are some of the opportunities that you see uh, for a country like Lesotho to really use cultural diplomacy uh, to move forward? Uh, and then secondly, what are some of the limitations uh, where maybe you say, you know what, cultural diplomacy actually can't help with this and this, and that's where we need the economics or the, the political aspects. Uh, where do you see the challenges and opportunities of cultural diplomacy from the point of view of the Soto? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm sure you, I, I do not need to define what cultural diplomacy is, but just a little bit. Uh, within the context of diplomacy in general, one believes that cultural diplomacy has been one of those pillars that have not been utilized if effectively and efficiently. It has been brought as a neighbor, not neighbor, as, uh, I'm talking German now, as, you know, back, playing backstage. But it is a most important tool of diplomacy. So cultural diplomacy is an important tool for diplomacy. It is an integral part of international diplomacy. It should be seen as that. And we have seen countries advancing and actually using the soft power of cultural diplomacy to advance their international country interests. Good examples of this of countries which have actually utilized cultural diplomacy to the best of their advantage, the United States through the United States Agency for International Development, through music, through jazz, and the whole culture of America, exporting culture, where music, where it has had tremendous impact globally, American culture. Even through radio, Voice of America, these are things that are used for, by countries to make sure that they can bring their culture to the fore rather than using hard power or economic power. England has used that through the BBC, bringing this culture through the uh, British Council. It is a means of cultural diplomacy. Germany is doing that also through the Deutsche Welle. And all this other musical, you know, bringing German culture through music, through poetry, through everything, are means of influencing other countries to be able to make sure that their culture and diplomacy is entrenched. Unfortunately, for most of African countries, this, this 
realization has come, albeit very late. And it is in the context that countries like mine and other ones are only just being poised to see cultural diplomacy as a good vehicle, not only for political, but it, and even to say that it's not only just about politics, especially after the Cold War. It is more about economy and what is it that we can do to advance economic growth, and cultural diplomacy is one of them. The Chinese have been using it. The ping-pong diplomacy sport as a vehicle for cultural diplomacy has been used, has been used very, very effectively and efficiently. The FIFA World Cup, for instance, you know, is one of those vehicles that, you know, uh, for sport. Sport is a vehicle not only for diplomacy, but also for peace. And culture can be used as a vehicle for people's understanding, tolerance. It can advance greater integration because it is only through understanding and appreciating one's culture that you can be able to understand and move beyond just tolerance, but to acceptance. So cultural diplomacy is an important vehicle. And we must all be able to be able to be doing that in our both individual and respective ways, because it is only through a forum like this and understanding, I understand you, I understand him, I understand everybody else, and I look at you not only through your perspective, understand you, and not only just tolerate your culture, but accept it, because that diversity is the one that makes us people. That is the one that makes us to be human beings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. I think that's a great start to, to the discussion after also a great keynote. I want to immediately now hand the microphone over to you. Uh, please share with us your questions, your comments, either related to the ambassador's uh, introductory speech uh, or also about the issue of the discussion. Uh, this is our chance. And we can really bounce the, the microphone around. So you've been taking four, five, six uh, points. Uh, then the ambassador can, can intervene whenever he would like. Uh, but I really would love to have this uh, to be a multilateral dialogue. So don't be shy. Uh, if, if you could please raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment or pose a question, that would be excellent. Who would like to go first? Okay, please. And if, as always, you could briefly introduce yourself. That would also be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Alexandra. I come from Denmark. And thank you for your speech. It was very interesting. Um, my question is about that when you spoke about uh, creating bridges from poverty, I am wondering why um, education wasn't mentioned. And now you just uh, mentioned the importance of understanding other cultures, and that will happen through education, I guess. So um, I was just wondering why it wasn't part of your slideshow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, when I mentioned the economic accelerators, I said I will not mention the other social accelerators. Health, education are key also to social to development. They give, education gives people a chance to choose. And unless you've got a chance to choose, that opportunity to choose, you cannot be able to be able to play a meaningful role either at the village level or at the community level. The most important thing that you have been given as a human beings, is the power to choose. And education is the catalyst for people to make informed decisions to choose. So it is vital, it is important. It is probably one of the most important things that, you know, governments or people or society should be able to do, education, because it gives you choices. In our context in Lesotho, education is number one in terms of the budget allocation. For, for development. In fact, it's education and health. We have got one of the highest rates of literacy rates in Africa for women or for uh, young girls at about 80%. Now, giving young people, especially women, education gives them opportunity to choose, to choose their fate, to choose what service they want to choose, how they want to live, they make informed choices, which will make them to live out of this marginalization process. 
So education is still very, very important. It is vital, it is important. It is a social accelerator. It is important. Thank you. Please. Okay. Hello, my name is Lynn. I'm from originally from, from Vietnam. I'm going to school now in the States, and I thank you very much for your speech here today. Um, I can see that uh, uh, your country has a lot of potential, uh, but still in the group of LCD, uh, LDCs. Um, I have two questions. The, uh, the first is, um, well, maybe maybe the, the country is still in L LDCs group because you know the country may lack external and internal effort to help it. Um, to help it out of poverty. Uh, so I wonder what are the main donor countries and interna international aid uh, that pouring investment in donors into your country? And second of all, what would, um, what would Lesotho do to prevent itself from falling into the dilemma of being donor? You know, like that happened to a lot of other African countries when African countries get a lot of international aid, but you know, it's still struck her in poverty and did not do, did not use the sauce very effectively. Thank you. <clears throat> Vietnam is a good example of one of those countries that have uh, gotten out of this trap to move out of, you know, an LDC status. And we have, we have also learned a couple of lessons from you, from Vietnam. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, the first, the first thing. The first question, in terms of uh, support to our budget as a donor, Ireland is the first. Ireland. Secondly is the United States. Uh, those are prime donor countries. Thirdly, China. And then the EU in general as a group, as a bloc. Yes. I, I thought, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that Lesotho is uh, one part of the Commonwealth countries. With the, yes, it is. Yeah, which it under is. the the very you know, and still under the influence of uh, the United Kingdom. Of British. But yeah, of British. British. Uh, how about no. the role in the country now? Okay. No. Yes. Yes, you are right. Lesotho is part of the Commonwealth, but the Commonwealth of Nations, or the Commonwealth itself as a as a body, is not a developmental or an aid body. That's number one, as a body. Secondly, Britain, it has countries that it prioritizes where it will put in their aid or their development assistance to. Last year, Britain, which is the head of the Commonwealth, cut developmental aid to developing countries, including Africa, including Lesotho, by over 60%, and they want to concentrate on terrorist, terrorism or anti-terrorism activities. The biggest bulk for the, of the United States, of, of Britain now, in terms of its official development assistance, is going to go to Afghanistan and India to counter terrorism. Yes. So, it's, for Lesotho, it's, it's marginal, it's, it's very small. So those are the ones, the countries that are. So. Yeah. So it's linked to the second questions of. Yes. Uh, you know, with the very, with the investment and donors from Ireland, um, and China, for example, how would you, um, you know, what is maybe the projection of the strategic plan of the country yes. to use it effectively, not to fall into the dilemma of other African countries. To you know, to being donored and and not and relying too much on donor aids and I mean on, on international aids and mm. yeah. Two issues here, two issues that uh, we we can debate and we can spend you know a whole session about this the donor effectiveness. It's a whole topic on itself. There are people that believe that countries should not receive aid on the one side. There are people that say it is enough, we do not have money, it's about time that the future should be in your hands and you go alone, it is your problem, right? On the one side. There are some who say, no, you cannot do that. 
when you look at the historical background and the gains that, have, that we have received or countries have done, gone through in terms of because of the effect of donor effectiveness and the impacts of those, if you are to cut the aid, you'll be negating the gains that you have received. It will depend on which side of the coin or which side of the, of the argument you go through because both arguments you can argue intelligently and effectively about them. But I don't think this is the forum. But it is important to know that it is a debate, an important debate. There are some who question the importance of aid effectiveness and its use because they will quote a few examples of where aid has been misused and misused with the sanction of the donors. Yeah? And they'll quote this when they do not to, to do their responsibilities in addressing inequality that exists, which have not been caused by even these countries. Then they'll question the issue of aid. Then they'll question, they'll say that aid should not be a vehicle. But when you look at the gains, that has happened in terms of addressing the Millennium Development Goals, in terms of addressing development in general, it has been, despite all those challenges, very, very important. A good example is UNAIDS, United Nations uh, Program of Combating HIV AIDS. Now, when you look at countries like, a country like mine, or Southern Africa, Southern Africa is an epicenter of the AIDS epidemic and other developing countries. It is happening also in the emerging countries. It has been subdued, the impact of this in some other even European countries. But for countries and for donors who, who do not want this problem to be solved, have actually cut down their AIDS to addressing HIV AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis using the pretext of religion, because they do not want to put in issues relating to contraception and family life into the equation, right? And therefore negating their responsibilities of supporting and helping. There is no country here, if I talk about Germany, for instance, well, the First World War started from Germany, the Second World War, after the Second World War, 90% of the countries stood with the German people to be able to fight against this dastardly Nazism and even gave the Germans a package to be able to come out of this and develop. Right? Now, it was, out of, it was not because we liked the Germans that they were given help. It was because of the realization that this is, they require, given the historical background of what has happened, the destruction, Surely it is important to help them to help themselves to come out of this dastardly action that has happened through the Nazism. Right? It was important to do that. We could not negate our responsibilities to say that it is your problem, you cause the war, so you suffer. So equally, people who now say the future of Africa lies in their hands and therefore the problems of Africa, Africa's, you know, they should solve it ourselves, are misguided. It is only purely to make sure that to advance the cause of it is important for them to stay there so that they cannot play a meaningful economic role in the global arena. This is why initiatives like the economic partnership agreements with Europe are being highly questioned as to are they really addressing the issues that, you know, of, of fairness, of trade liberalization, are they really? My side, I believe that aid is important. Countries will still need bridges. Countries will still need uh, countries and partners to those alliances that, that I mentioned about. A good example is the fall of the Communist Union, where the EU made a strategic decision, a strategic decision after the fall of the Communist War to be able to help those Eastern European countries with capacity building, with resources, to make sure that those, they bridged that gap, that disparity that existed between the East and the West was important for the EU to make sure that they help these countries to bridge that gap so that they can play a meaningful role 
in Europe a meaningful role within the global arena. If that did not happen, one of the consequences of that would have been tremendous migration of people from the East and coming to the West and you know, making an imbalance and consequently leaving those areas underdeveloped. And when you have your neighbors being underdeveloped and you don't bring the gap, the impacts of that both inside your country and across are phenomenal. So we must make sure that those bridges are gap, are, are, those gaps are bridged. So my side of the story is that, yes, there are, there's been some elements of uh, incredible amount of misuse of donor funding in some areas, but there have been more gains than the negative impacts. So we advise and continue to be I personally and everybody else who's on this advances that it is important because you can see the importance and the gains that have done where you have averted death, you have averted illness, and you have made significant progress. And this is attested by a number of NGOs that are playing a key role in advising their governments to make sure that issue of donor assistance and support to country development programs are being done. There are some countries, especially the least developing countries, where they rely on their budget allocation. From 40 to 60 percent of their budget is dependent on donor assistance. Without that, these countries would completely collapse. Because of conflicts that have happened, because of other reasons that have happened, capacity building, because of no resources, uh, etc. And as I say, your country, Vietnam, We've learned a lot from it. For Lesotho, in our national development agenda, we want to move out of the LDCs by 2020. And we've identified those things that I've mentioned there as one of those key issues. If we do it right, who should leave us, make sure that we graduate from the LDC to another level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Continue the discussion. My name is Malte Kaufmann, I'm from Germany. Uh, I'm a businessman involved in the Chamber of Commerce, also in the uh, uh, Rhein-Neckar region, and uh, I'm working on a PhD uh, at the moment. Um, I'm, I was really interested again to hear how much resources Africa has, and especially also your country, natural resources, human resources, there are huge markets also for um, uh, our companies and uh, we hear a lot of uh, Chinese investment, Arab investment, but uh, yet many um, European companies and uh, American companies are very reluctant to uh, invest in Af Africa and go into Africa. <coughs> My question is why is that? Why are the Chinese so open? Why, why do they come and uh, what can be done to overcome maybe the fears. I, I often hear about fears of corruption, of instable governments maybe. What can be overdone to attract businesses to come to your country? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> First of all, I must indicate that I, I indicated to you that Lesotho has got a population of 2.2 million people, 20,000 square kilometers. So. For an economic scale, for only business, on, an, on a scale of economic scale, it is tiny, very tiny. We would not like to see, unless you have got a niche that you have identified, it will be difficult for any investor or entrepreneur to come and invest in Lesotho. This is why we have looked at those key important issues of renewable energy, you know, which is key. And, a number of German companies that are interested in investing in renewable energy in the sort in tourism, making networks with German uh, tour operators to be able to uh, visit the sort And the idea is not that they should, it should be a fallacy or a dream for me to think that there'll be a plain load of people leaving from here, from Tegel to land in Maseru. No. We want to package tourism for the whole Sadak region, as I mentioned. It, it only makes sense and adds value and makes it even sense for the tourists themselves that when they do visit, they, feel they visit the region. When you look at the Caribbean, people don't say they're going to Jamaica. They don't go to Barbados. They go to the, to the Caribbean. 
it's packaged as a, as a whole, and they can move through all those Caribbean islands. The same thing, we, we want to move in that direction. We want, it, it only makes sense to do so, to move in that direction. So most of the people as it stands now, they visit Namibia, they believe South Africa. We want the, the tourists also to get value and see the best of the region. If they spend 10 days in, in, in South Africa, they should spend three days in Lesotho, three days in Malawi, three days in Swaziland. It, it adds value and you know, it's cost benefit for the, for the tourists, right? So the other thing is this. It is, it, it, is, it is very strange. I have sung and frothed and danced and sung, you know, <laughs> in talks about what you've just said to the German uh, private sector. They will complain about Chinese involvement in Africa and investment in Africa. Yeah? That Chinese are plumbering our resources. The Chinese, the workmanship of the Chinese is not good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, yes, why are you not going to invest in our country? And yet the same, the same German companies, you have moved from Europe to go and invest in China. Why? Why are you investing in China? 80% of the German industries here have got investment in China. Why? And I ask, why can't you come and invest in the Come and invest in Zadag. No, we're afraid of corruption. What corruption? <laughs> we have tried to regularize our policies. We have tried to give incentives. We have tried everything else possible. But no, they'll always have this fear of their own. It, and I must say that it is true that there are the macroeconomic you know, uh, challenges that are facing Africa and developing countries are huge. So you must make sure that you have appropriate incentives. You must have appropriate legal legal frameworks for, you know, for, making, for doing business, you must make sure that uh, the doing business environment is conducive for investors. You must make sure that you have got adequate infrastructure to do that, which is still lacking. And China fortunately has. When you look at even the production of goods that are cheaper in China, but of utmost importance with the Chinese is that they have got the skills and the know-how. You know, because of education and technical vocational training, they have got those skills, you know? Uh, this guy who just passed away of, uh, of Microsoft, what is his name? Steve, Steve from Jobs, Apple. Yes, from Apple, sorry. Yeah. President of the United States, Barack Obama, asked him, said, Mr. Uh, jobs. Why can't you mean to tell? Why can't we bring those people, uh, those jobs that are being created uh, in China, to bring them back to the United States? You know what he said? Now you know what he said. What Steve Jobs said? What did he say? No, the lady, the lady, the lady, the lady. Yeah. What did he, what, what did he say? What did Steve Jobs say? Yeah. He probably said something like. Uh -huh create some more jobs, like different skill jobs. The jobs yeah. are already gone, they will never come back. Exactly. Yeah. He, he, said, he said, Steve Jobs said, the jobs will never come back to the United States, Mr. President. Forget it. There will be no Americans who will be willing to stay in a dormitory, 200 people in a dormitory to work. Forget it. it there will not even be, there, not even five would, uh, will, will agree to stay in a, in a dormitory, never mind 200. And yet the Chinese are doing it. So forget it, they will not come, and it is true. So lastly, we have tried to, uh, to do good regulatory frameworks, good macroeconomic performances, uh, and you know, macroeconomic models to make sure that investment happens. It is not going to be easy because of the competition that we're having with the Asian market and uh, Latin American market because of education and the skills level and the capacity and the lack of infrastructure. So, but I can tell you, the opportunities are there. Opportunities for development on a win-win basis. We're not saying that people should come there and, you know, uh, we're saying, you come to Africa, you come to Sarak, you make money, right? Make money. You help us create jobs. 
add value to our projects, and everybody else stays happy. That's what we want to see happening, a win-win situation, not a win-lose situation. But unfortunately, as, the, as, as, as life is, whenever one has got an advantage over the other, it becomes very difficult to dismount this horse. That is the situation, unfortunately. So, but we'll have to keep on fighting. We'll have to keep on coming up with innovative ways, making sure that we put in place means and ways of making sure that we can attract foreign direct investment on a win-win basis. And then, if we do that, we'll graduate from relying on donor. But donor assistance, it happens even within, within developed countries. Clear example of that that has happened is the, uh, the, you know, Greece. Clear example, without that support, what would happen? And there may be even some other ones that are coming. So the argument, to come back to you again, the argument of donors giving money to countries and being misused are false, are based on a false premise. Thank you. No, thank you also for the question. If I could just add something briefly, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the first challenge, I would argue, for cultural diplomacy is actually to break stereotypes. Uh, I think, first of all, to try to come to that moment where we have sort of, a, let's say, an even playing field and say, okay, forget everything you think you know about my country and, and let's start talking or let's come into dialogue. And I think that's actually a challenge really around the world, uh, the first challenge that you actually have as a cultural diplomat. So, no, very, very good question. I think just next to you, there's this one who'd like to add something. My name is Amy, and I was born in South Africa, which is pretty close. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot about um, international inter interaction engagement with, with Africa, for example, the Chinese investment. I was wondering if you could highlight the intra-African trade and union uh, agreements that have started to occur with Africa working within its, its continent to engage with one another and, and spread development and growth that way. Okay. Excuse me, thank you. Uh, I'll start with the SADAG. The issue of removing barriers on customs union, as I mentioned that the five countries, Lesotho, South Africa, Botswana, Swaziland, and Namibia, was a tremendous step in terms of, for those, three con for those five countries to trade amongst themselves without paying customs, you know, amongst themselves. That's very important. The oldest customs union it has worked it is albeit has got it's a number of problems now because uh, of the greater cooperation with, with SADAC. But as I, as I indicated, that we still want SADAC to have a, its own customs union. Access to trade, I mentioned that is one of the things that free trade area, creation of a free trade area, is very, very important. And within all these economy, regional economic entities, the issue of free trade is important. But I've mentioned the challenges, that the challenges that are facing these are both structural rigidities that exist inside their own countries, that the commitments which hamper the speed acceleration of this, and policy frameworks that need to be regulated and regulatory frameworks. They negate or they do not facilitate this good in initiatives. But we have seen tremendous improvement within the SADC area of trade. We see South African investing in Lesotho, South Africa investing in Botswana, and Botswana investing in Zimbabwe. You know, uh, we have seen Namibia investing in Angola, investing in Botswana. So there are some investments that are happening within the region. We are also seeing even with SADAC and COMESA and the East African community, we're seeing a number of initiatives that allows for trade with the East African community. Even within the East African community itself, there are a number of trade. Trade happens more within this international, within this regional groupings than I mean, in the African continent than perhaps even with, with, within other uh, regional blocks like in, in the EU because of the restrictive and measures that that have been put in place. ECOWAS, trade within ECOWAS, 
within those countries there. It's phenomenal. In fact, probably ECOWAS is only one of those regional economic entities where trade, inter-trade between the countries is much more than even in the SADC region within ECOWAS. There's a lot of um, oil-rich countries in Africa. So I was thinking, is that a, a burgeoning uh, opportunity, for example, in Angola? Uh, to trade within Africa instead of um, being so interdependent possibly on the Middle East and oil exports? Okay. Uh, if, if you look, the, the issue of oil, again, you know, some of this, the wealth of this nations or of these countries uh, are phenomenal, and the challenges that they're facing are phenomenal also within the context of the overall developmental challenges that are facing the, the world. Angola, you'll be surprised. You remember I mentioned that Angola is one of the LDCs. And yet Angola is the fastest growing economy when you look at its GDP growth. It is called the fastest, fastest growing. And it has been like that in the past two years. You know, its growth is about 12% to 14%, unsurpassed. And yet Rwanda, the capital, is the most expensive capital in the whole world. The disparities, and I'm, I can talk about, about this just by the fact that, you know, I hope my colleagues will understand, but it's just a matter of showing. But the disparities that happen inside the country are huge. Not to say mine are, even mine are still huge. So it is a challenge as to how best are we going to be able to maximize and use these benefits, these resources, properly and meaningfully for improving the quality of life of our peoples. It's a big challenge. But it is not only just the internal factors that apply, but there are also external factors. Internal factors relating to education, challenges of not enough infrastructure, capacity building and the know-how, the technology to be able to do things where these issues are being controlled somewhere and they, the shots are being called from there, from outside. If you've got the technology, you'll dictate, you say, yes, you've got the resource, but I've got the technology. But it's a big challenge. Okay. We should probably start one in the studio close, but I'd be happy to take maybe one or two final questions. Maybe our colleague from Sierra Leone first, uh, since you're up soon with your, your speech, but please. Thank you, uh, His Excellency. Your presentation was very informative and interesting. <coughs> During your talk on uh, integration of cultural diplomacy into, <clears throat> into nation building, you raise an issue which I think is very cor correct. If at all, the world should go the way we want it to go. You touch on the cultural diversity and respect for individual countries, uh, cultures. But recently, we've heard from the West. Western leaders, for example, like uh, the British Prime Minister, raising the issue of gay rights to be integrated into African system. Otherwise, they will not give aid. We all know that is an alien thing among many, many African countries. For the West now to be coming that as conditionality to aid and given the circumstances in which most African countries face that of abject poverty, bad economy amid the global economic downturn. What is your take to such condition, conditionality in the future for uh, Africa? Mm. Uh, he has brought two issues. Again, these issues, uh, I are very controversial, and we can talk about them until you know doomsday. But one, the issue of gay rights. I would, I would, I would like to beg to differ. I will differ with you on the fact that it is alien to African culture. I, I would beg to differ. I, I would differ as a person with that notion, as a person, yeah? and as a doctor. I would differ with any advancement of that argument. Because 
I have seen and I know that it is not alien. So, it's not alien, but it's not public. Okay, good. Now, that's, that's something else different. So, it does exist. <laughs> it does exist. People don't talk about it. It is only now that people start talking about it. What I do not agree with, on the other hand, is for anybody to put that as a condition for supporting a country. Just like you would not put, it, not only that, but even other conditions you know, like the use of condoms as a conditionality for supporting someone, or the use of the pill of contraceptive method as a, as a, as a vehicle for denying people support. Because I can choose any other thing that I can and justify as to why I do not want to support you. And countries have done so, even in the past. So the issue of conditionality of supporting and putting conditions, it is almost tantamount to blackmail, which is immoral. So there is a need for engagement rather than, you know, sanctions and, you know, heavy-handedness. That is where diplomacy counts. That is what is, that is what is, that is what we need as people who make sure that we discuss and debate around these issues and find out why. But it is as ludicrous to say that because you have not entrenched gay rights into your constitution, and therefore I'll make that to be. But it's also ludicrous for countries to be able to ban and jail people because of their sexual orientation. It is equally wrong for them to do so. Who are you, or who are we, that I can judge your orientation? Because it is not of your own making. How should I, because it, it is smacks of all those things that have been evil in the past, of racism, intolerance, and all those other things that we have been fighting for. So we cannot be able to do that in relation to sexual orientation. I have as much right, if you agree, to have a relationship with you without anybody else questioning it and even making it by, by law, if we agree that we should have a kind of relationship. Yes, in the same way that I, if we agree to have a relationship with you, no gay person should be able to have the moral high ground of saying that, no, you should not do that, or because I happen to be black and you're white, that somebody else should come and determine that this relationship between me and you is not good. So equally the same thing. So we have to look at these things and know that they do exist and they will exist in different ways. We have to look at them, discuss them as rationally and as logically as possible to make sure that these things do not happen where somebody else's rights are being trampled to an extent where that you'll put them into jail because of their orientation. And equally, people should not be punished. You should engage them. Because if you, as you, the example that you have put, you then by age because of those kind of the impact of your act the, on the number of gains that have happened could be catastrophic in terms of you know, uh, disease prevention, making sure that mothers don't die, health promotion, education, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we do not need to go there. Thank you. Sorry, just an idea. Do you think it is morally right for them to be allowed to adopt you? Oh. Yes. I, 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 again, I'll talk. <laughs> Morality. I, 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 cannot, I, I cannot sit here and talk about morals. I, I will be the last person that can sit down here on this chair and talk about morals. I, I, will, be, I, will, I, will, I will be the last. However, however, 
I do not think that there are universal values and morals. If, if I want to adopt a child and I've got the means, it has got nothing to do with morals. It has, it's got nothing to do with morals. So, if the child is there and has got nobody to look after, and I feel love for that person and for that child, and I can give them a future, whatever, let it be done. I cannot put a moral value to it. I, I cannot put moral value to philanthropy. I cannot put monetary value to the beauty of the setting sun. How can I? To the beauty of a setting sun. Can you put a value, a, a, an economic value to it? To the beauty of the setting sun. So, I, I would hope that, I, I would hope with all due respect that we should avoid going to those moral issues because once you do that, it will negate the same thing that we're trying to do here of making tolerance and cultural diplomacy a vehicle for tolerance, a vehicle for understanding. Because then we'll be using values, value judgments, and it's got no place for diplomacy and especially for people's understanding. Thank you very much. I think you can see what I was saying when I was talking about uh, the, the closeness to the, the vision of a cultural diplomacy. I think very much, as you both, I think, pointed out there, I think it also, it all begins with respect. And I think there, that would also be, I think, a prerequisite for cultural diplomacy. We were talking about breaking stereotypes, and I think that that mutual respect is key. Uh, otherwise, it's really not possible sometimes to engage and build any kind of understanding or trust. Uh, and maybe just to add one other small point there, what makes China such an attractive partner uh, for so many African countries is the fact that usually there's no strings attached. Uh, they will come and invest, and they don't you know, put any, any strings onto it. So in that sense, actually, Europe is making itself a much more unattractive partner uh, by adding those strings onto it. Uh, and you know, whether Europe likes it or not, China is getting more and more active. That's one of the reasons, I think, why China is so attractive as a partner. Uh, we're, we are running uh, close on time, but I think maybe one final question oh, or comment? Uh, just, or? just to add on that, oh, on, on, on the China issue, yes. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned this. One of the things is this. For most of developing countries and you know, my country, in order to address these challenges, we need partners, as I said, right, and alliances. So my people will need a road from A to, Z, to Z. Excuse me, yeah? They have been identified as a felt need. Yeah? There will be a felt need for a clinic or a hospital a felt need to address these issues of poverty, health issues. There will be that need, a, rea a reality. So what happens? In most cases, I'll, I'll come to our partners, and I'm making an example, not to say that this is, but in most cases, it will be like that. I'll come to, uh, to the EU and say, I need a road from A to Z, to Z or to Germany. They'll say to me, Ambassador, yes, you know, we're concerned about your human rights issues, you know, we're concerned about good governance, you know, we're concerned about, uh, you know, uh, lack of transparency, you know, you need to address this really seriously. And I say, yes, we're addressing it, we're addressing it. Yes, really, we're trying to address it. Yeah, but, you know, we're not quite happy. Last week we heard that one of the journalists was arrested, you know, and so on. I say, yeah, but that's, that's an unfortunate situation. But, you know, the majority of the women are dying because they don't have a road to go there, you know, help us to do the road. I say, okay, write a proposal. You don't have the capacity to write a proposal, damn it. So, you write the proposal. It has to come through a number of channels. It has to go to the EU. They dot the I's and the T's and send it back to you. By the time you get that road, if you are lucky, it will take you three years. If you are lucky. 
now. Meantime, people are still dying. You don't have the rope. You don't have the money because you're constantly doing other things, trying to address your development challenges. So what happens? I request to go and visit China, or I invite the Chinese uh, Minister of Economics, I said, uh, come and visit us. You know, I show him, I said, you know, my people have, you know, this is one of the priority areas. C can you help us to build this road? Because China has been a developing country, they understand, and they've just moved out of that. They understand what poverty means. They understand it very well. It is only people who not understand poverty, where poverty is purely an academic exercise. They will not understand what it means when somebody has to, has to walk, you know, for six hours to go to a clinic. The Chinese know it. Most of the people in Europe do not know it. They do not know this. They, they don't know it. So you'll understand and you'll say, we'll build you that road. Now, at that particular time, for most of the countries, it is not the quality of the road that matters. Yeah? What matters is the fact that the road is there and it will make access. Whether it's temporary access for two, for two years or not, it's not of importance. The most important thing is that it will be there and on a temporary basis, it will address the felt need at that particular time. This is the difference. For children and mothers who are marginalized, there is no time for tomorrow to address their needs. It's not tomorrow. You can't wait for tomorrow. It is now. We have to address these issues now, not tomorrow. And this is why we go to the Chinese. This is why we go to the Irish. They will understand that because Ireland, Ireland, the ambassador was here, Ireland, 50 years ago, was a developing country. It was one of the poorest countries in Europe. So we'll go to them, they'll help us. Korea, 50 years ago, was a, develop, was a least developing country. We'll go to them. They understand what poverty means. It is not theory. It is not theory when you talk about poverty. It is a reality. So they'll understand it. Sorry, sorry. Well, thank you very much for that. I thought that was a very important uh, reflection. However, as a result of that good reflection, I do think that we should conclude out of respect, speaking of you respect, for okay. the dancers. We have a number of dancers waiting to perform, okay. and we're already, I think, about 15 minutes late. Okay. And we have a special Lesotho coffee break right now. Uh, so luckily, since uh, Lesotho has been kind enough to sponsor this coffee break, what I would suggest, those who were not able to ask your questions, we could do so during the coffee break, uh, where we'll have a chance to have a taste of Lesotho, uh, and really also privilege a little bit the color of Lesotho, uh, before the final presentation and performance of the day from Sierra Leone. So before you leave your seats, if I could ask everyone to please give a very, very sincere expression of our gratitude to Ambassador Nafisi. Thank you.